Jared Poland Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a free user guide for the Sony A7C II. Now, if you already purchased one, this video is gonna help you set up the camera and explain all of the different buttons and features and the things that I would use and how I would personally set them. Now, if you're looking to purchase this camera, we have used this in the real world and we do have a link down below where you can see it in action so you can decide for yourself whether you wanna pick it up or not. But this isn't a review, this is a video to help you set up the camera because not everybody reads the user manual anymore and I want to be your user manual. Now keep in mind this is going to be a very long video. Now we do have a table of contents down below if you want to skip around because you don't need the very basics and fundamentals of turning it on, where the cards go, where the battery goes and understanding all of the buttons. We do have a table of contents so you can skip around to find exactly what you need but also save this video so that you can come back to it whenever you need a refresh. Let's start with the outside of the camera. A little later on, we're gonna go into the menus, going into how to shoot for photos, as well as how to shoot for video. But right now, let's start with the basics. When you get this camera, even if you get it with a lens, it's going to come separate. The lens will never ship with the, the body attached to it or the body will not have a lens attached to it. So keep in mind that's going to be separate. You're also gonna have your battery and you don't have a memory card because Sony doesn't ship these with a memory card. Let's start with the bottom of the camera because that is where you put the battery. Right here, this door flips open like that. It's a springy spring. You pop the battery out just like this and this is your Z battery. This is a battery that Sony's been using for years, and it's a fantastic battery, has a lot of juice, a lot of power, so it's gonna let you shoot and film for a long period of time. Now, I always recommend that you carry an extra battery because you never know if something goes wrong. It's rare that a battery is just gonna up and die on you, but it's nice to have a backup in case you forget to charge it one day and you come out and it doesn't have a charge in it and you need to put the other battery in there. You can also charge this camera with USB-C, so keep that in mind when you are thinking about how to charge it. But to put it back in, we've got this little blue switch right here. You just press that out of the way with the battery and you pop it in. It can only go in one way. Shut the door, clip it in with the lock, and you are good to go right there. The next thing to talk about is where does the memory card go? Right here, there's a switch. You open it. It's a springy board. It pops open and your SD card goes right here. We press, pops out, and this is your SD card. Remember that the SD card is what you're saving your photos to. Do not cheap out. You just spent all of this money on a beautiful camera, and the last thing you wanna do is buy some no-name brand card. Now, I say no-name brand, but you may not have a good understanding of what a name brand card would be. Sony makes a card called a tough card. Sony makes very good memory cards. SanDisk makes very good cards. ProGrade Digital makes very good cards. Lexar makes cards as well. One of the things that you need to watch out for is if you're gonna purchase on Amazon, that sometimes they've been known to have counterfeit cards on there and you wanna be very careful. I recommend that you make a purchase of memory cards from a reputable camera store, one of those like Allen's Camera, where I shop at allenscamera.com. You've got B&H, you've got Adorama, you've got Sammy's. There's plenty of good camera stores out there. Make sure you purchase from a reputable one because if the card is too good to be true or it's super cheap but it's supposed to be the best card, I wouldn't mess with it because the last thing you want to have happen is you lose all of your memories that you captured with because you went with a bad card. So to put it in, it only goes in one way, clips in, shut the door, put the lock out, and there, that is how you put the memory card in. Now let me show you how to take the lens off and put it on. We're going to start with take it off. No, we're not because your lens will not be on there. So here we go. This is your camera right here. Do you see this image sensor in the back? Yeah, that image sensor right there is sensitive. You don't really wanna leave it open and exposed to the environment because you don't wanna damage that. There's no shutter coming down to protect it. So keep in mind that if you're gonna change lenses, try to do it in an environment where there's not a lot of dust flying around, not a lot of wind, or you turn your back to it, or you hold the camera down like this when you are changing lenses. Also, I always recommend turning the camera off when you change lenses, so never, I mean never touch inside of this camera. Never touch this image sensor ever. Don't let your dog sniff it. Don't let your kids play with it. Don't put your nose in there to sniff it. Don't touch it because if you ruin that, your camera is basically ruined. But here's how we put a lens on. 
Right here on the camera, do you see that white dot? There's a white dot there. There is also a white dot on my lens. What I do is I go ahead and line them both up just like this. Here's the white dot. Here's the white line. Put it on and I twist it the only way that it goes until it clicks in. It is now on there. To take it off, there is a lens release switch right down here. We press that and we rotate the other way and the lens comes right off. I know this might scare you at the very beginning because it scared me at the very beginning, but just line everything up, make sure the camera's off, line it up, click it in and you're good to go. Now would be a good time to tell you that lenses tend to be more expensive than the camera body that you use because glass, 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 glass. Photography is all about one, understanding the fundamentals of photography, the shutter speed aperture and ISO, which you'll get to in the future, but understand that better glass will help you get better results. Getting cheaper lenses may not be a bad thing, but understand that cheaper might lead to less quality images. That's why I've always strived to push for glass, 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 glass. There's companies like Tamron and Sigma that make lenses for the Sony E-mount, which will work on this camera. That is a good way to save some money, but still get quality glass that may not be the top of the top of the line from Sony, but it's gonna be perfect for everything that you need. So now that we have a lens on the camera, I do want to show you how I suggest holding a camera when you're shooting, and it's not like this. This is not how you do it. Now, many of you may have come from shooting with a cell phone where you're used to just doing everything on the back of the screen and not having a viewfinder. Well, you have a viewfinder on this camera. So the way that I suggest that you shoot, you put your right hand here, you put your left hand underneath the lens, always underneath when it's a smaller lens like this. You tuck your elbows in, you put your eye up to the viewfinder, and this is the most stable way of shooting. You use your thumb and your forefinger to go ahead and zoom. You don't do this. This just doesn't look professional, but it's also awkward to do, and you can't keep everything nice and level. This is the best way to do it. Nice and tight, create that tripod, get those elbows in, and that's how you make it stable. I think it's unprofessional looking when people are doing this or they're, they're just like, I'm gonna shoot pictures of someone right in front of me. Now with that being said, you do have a flip out and rotatable screen on this. So if you ever need to get down low, I'm totally fine if you can't get down low, turning the screen like this and, and pointing it where you need to, or if you need to hold it above your head in those rare situations, that's okay to do. But just keep in mind, the fundamental and best way, in my opinion, and by that I mean fact, is to hold the camera like this when you're shooting most stable and the best way to get the best results now let's move to the top of the camera showing you how to turn it on the funny thing is I use all the different cameras from all the different brands and I keep thinking that this switch right here is on and off because that switch is on and off on other brand cameras but this is simple it says on and off right here you've got on you've got off you've got a switch right here on this you pull it towards you it goes on you push it away from you and it goes off very simple. Now, inside of this housing, you have your shutter button. This is what you use to take your picture. I know it's simple, but it also has multiple functions. One of those might be setting your video to record. Another is, the most important, well, second most important, is you press it halfway down. It's like a springboard. You feel it. You can press it halfway down without going all the way. That's how you're going to autofocus your camera. You press it halfway down. You feel that spring. You're good. You press it all the way in, and you're going to get pictures, or you're going to get a picture or multiple pictures, depending on how you have your camera set, because you can shoot rapid fire. That is where your, that's how you shoot your pictures. This red button right here, well, it's silver on this camera, but with a red ring around it, that is a custom function button that is set to record video. You can change that if you'd like, but if you want to shoot video, you go boom, and you can shoot video right from here by doing that. Now this switch that I thought was the on and off switch, which it's not, is the way that you can change the different functions of the camera. Right now when it's pressed all the way up, we're in stills mode for shooting stills photo. If we want to go here, we can see this icon, which is a video camera. That is when you want to go into the full video mode to take control of shooting video. Now in stills mode, you can still activate video, but when you want more control, you can go into the video mode. And the last one is the SNQ, which is how you get into 
fast and slow motion type videos. That is when you're gonna get out of auto, you're gonna be able to take more control of your camera and get into those settings to shoot at different frame rates for fast motion and also for slower motion video. Now continuing around the top of the camera, we've got this dial right here. This is a custom dial that you can set to multiple different things. I might personally set it to using it for ISO, which is how we're gonna go from uh, more sensitive to less sensitive. This is a great place for it. Sony did a great job with giving you options with this camera because right here on the back of it, this is where you're gonna control your shutter speed. This is a dial, a command dial that will control shutter speed. And then on the front side here, we've got the one for your aperture. So that's how you're gonna control aperture is rotating that dial and shutter speed dial is right here, which means I'm gonna set this dial most likely to ISO because it's much easier and quicker to do that than going into the menu system. Now on top here, this is your dial. Currently, when you get it out, when you first purchase it, it's most likely going to be an auto. That's where the camera's gonna take all of the control for you and make all of the decisions. It does a very good job, right, when you're first starting out, but this camera is super powerful. I recommend learning the features and learning how you can take control of your photography or video by getting out of auto. Right Around the dial, you've got P, which is program mode. It's basically full auto, but it unlocks more stuff in the menu that you can control. You've got an A, which is aperture priority, where you set the aperture and the camera is going to set everything else for you. Then you've got S, which is shutter priority, where if you wanted to set the shutter speed at say one one thousandth of a second, the camera will set the aperture and ISO automatically to compensate to meet that one one thousandth of a second shutter speed. I personally live in M, which is manual mode. That's where I take full control of the camera. But you also have one, two, and three, which are user settings that you can say, well, if I'm in a bright situation, I'm gonna turn to this. If I'm in a dark situation, I'm gonna turn to two. And you can custom set these, which comes in handy depending on what you're shooting. Continuing to the middle of the top of the camera, we have a hot shoe. This is a digital hot shoe. So this is where you traditionally would put your flash, but more so these days, people are putting microphones there. Now, being that this is a digital hot shoe, Sony sells microphones that connect right into the hot shoe that sends all of the data right through the digital interface of the hot shoe in to the camera. So you don't have to have any external cables running to the microphone port on the side of the camera to record the audio. So if you do get the Sony microphones, you can do that. We personally like using microphones from Rode. They make some fantastic microphones, but you will have to plug that into the side of the camera because that's they don't have a digital interface to do so. Now, you see you have a line right here. That's the line just to show you that we're in manual mode right there. Moving on here, we have these two holes which I believe is where your speaker is. So when you're playing back the videos that you recorded, on the camera. You could also plug into a headphone jack, which I'll show you in a second, but that's where you will hear, it's a very small speaker, but that's where you'll get the playback right there. Now, this right here is where you would put your lens strap. These are lugs, they call them nuts lug nuts or something, but this is where you would attach the strap to the camera. I do recommend that you have some sort of way of strapping it to yourself so that you just don't drop it and put it down. So the old traditional way is you put it over your neck and do it. I use something called a Black Rapid strap. There's other companies out there like Peak Design. They have a strap that they have. So there's different types of things, whether it's a wrist strap or a neck strap. There's a lot of options today that you could choose from. Now let's go back to the bottom of the camera. Camera. We already saw that we can put the battery in here. There's not much going on on the bottom of the camera, but we do have this quarter 20. This is where you would put your tripod plate or you would attach this to a tripod. Now moving over to the side of the camera, we saw that this is where we put our memory card, but we also have a few other doors. We got that door, door number one, and door number two, which I need to do that for. So door number one has an HDMI port that is a micro HDMI port. So if you wanna go do some video out or you wanna go to a TV, you could do it right there. And this is your headphone jack. 
The one that's red is your microphone jack. So if you do get one of those Rode microphones or another microphone that you need to plug into the side, you plug it right in here and that's how it puts the audio into your file from the microphone. And then you've got your USB-C port right there for transferring files. If you wanna do that, I still recommend getting a card reader or if you use an Apple MacBook Pro that's more new, you could just plug the SD card right into the side of that and transfer the data. You can also charge the camera from this at this point, so keep that in mind if you need to get some extra juice into your uh, camera. You could use one of those USB-C charging banks for your phone and it can charge the camera as well. So we close these back up. We're gonna go around to the front of the camera. There's not much going on here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see this, Stephen. Can you see this right here? Yep. Those are, these are your microphones, the built-in microphones. They're good. They're not gonna be as good as putting a shotgun microphone or, or if you're recording something, I'm wearing a lavalier underneath my shirt. That's a microphone uh, that's much better to use for doing commentary because the last thing you wanna do is, if you're shooting video, have really bad audio. So the way to have better audio is to put a mic on yourself or use one of those shotgun mics. Now, let me take the lens off so I can show Steven something right here. Um, there is this, this little light right here. I end up turning off that LED light. It's supposed to help you focus in low light situations. I just find it to be more of a distraction. So I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna turn that off in the menu when we get there. We already talked about the lens release switch, which is right there. You press that button. And other than that, that's it, man. That's, that's the front of the camera. Um, but, but I should also show you this, cause I'm looking at the lens hood. I always use my lens hood. When you have a camera and, and a lens, this is how you usually get it, right? There's a lens hood. This is called a bayonetting lens hood. It can go backwards or you can take it off and then put it out like this. If you have a lens hood, you should always leave it out like this. One, it's gonna help get better images because it's gonna cut down on stray light coming into your lens. But also if you knock it on something, it can help protect the lens because you're gonna hit the lens hood and not hit the actual element of your lens. Moving to the other side of the camera, there's nothing here, Steven. There's, there's nothing here. Sometimes they put stuff here, sometimes they don't. You got nothing there. Let's go to the back of the camera. So there's a lot to talk about back here. This is your electronic viewfinder. So when I turn the camera on, you can see that the screen shows up, right? This is your LCD screen, this is a touch screen. So one of the new features they've added to the touch screen is that you can swipe from the right to get a custom menu, and I can swipe it back to get rid of it, and also swipe down to the bottom to get the custom function menu. Lots of great stuff just on the touchscreen, which helps you not have to go into the menu system, but I just wanted to show you that real fast. Let me swipe it out of the way because this is your electronic viewfinder. I already showed you how to hold the camera. This is basically a little TV screen. Everything you see inside here is what your image sensor is seeing. It's also the same thing that you're gonna see on the LCD screen. But what is this little thing right here next to the EVF? This is a proximity sensor. So when you pull your eye up to the camera, it knows that your face is there and it goes off and switches to the electronic viewfinder. Now, if you find yourself saying, well, the electronic viewfinder is on and my face isn't up to it, why isn't it switching? One thing could be the sensor might be dirty on the proximity sensor or there might be a drop of water. If there's a drop of water and it might be from Jupiter, drops of Jupiter in Mars or whatever that train song was, you just wipe it off and then you're good to go. So I'm gonna turn the camera off for now so it's not a distraction. To the right of the proximity sensor, this is your diopter control. If you wear glasses, now I wear glasses, I don't shoot photos with glasses. I take them off and I go ahead and I set the diopter. What you should do is you put the menu up in the camera and you just move the diopter until the text looks sharp and that's for you. It might be different for each person, but if you do wear glasses, you can change the diopter so that it matches what your glasses offer you. We've got a menu button, a custom function button. We've got the AF on button. Now keep in mind, a lot of these buttons, not the menu one, are customizable, where we can change them inside of the menu system to change it to whatever you want it to be, or almost whatever you want it to be. Um, I can be anything I want to be. I like that song. You've got your AF on, and also you see the white magnifying glass next to it? That's a sub menu, a sub feature or function that you can use this for. So when we're playing back images, well, when you hit the AF on, that's gonna zoom in. 
So that's one of those things that it lets you do. You've got your function button, which is very powerful. You've got your spinny wheel. This is another way that you can custom function and make changes on the camera. The center button presses in. That's basically your OK button. But don't forget, you can touch your LCD screen. You can flip it out and rotate it like I showed you earlier. You've got your playback button right here. You've got your trash can, where if I say this, it's the first time I've ever say it, uh, said it. But what happens when you press the trash can, Stephen? Oscar the Grouch That's comes right, out. Oscar the Grouch comes out. That's how you delete images on the camera if you want to do that. I still don't recommend doing that. And also, you can hit up, and that's going to do that function. You could hit to the right, which is currently set to ISO. You could hit down, and you could also hit left. So up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. There's no BA, and there's no BA, and there's no select start, but you don't get 30 men in Contra with this, but maybe you should try it because it might unlock something else. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you Fropac 4 in action on this photo taken with the A7C2, starting with Blue's Clues, followed by Brooklyn, C41, Coppertone, DeLorean, High C, Kaleidoscope, Mel Brooks, Saltwater Taffy, Thick, Tintype, and Wet Hot American Summer. But check out the adaptive preset called X3 just to enhance the eyes. Watch this. One click over here, I select the irises, which the computer already found. Let's zoom in on it. Watch what I do to the eyes. Boom. I can brighten them up ever so slightly, not too far. And with one click of the button, it is basically done. But check this one out from Fropac1, my all-time favorite. With one click, we've got Skittles. Boom. It looks fantastic. So look, if you want to speed up your raw workflow or you're not sure where to start and you're just tired of other presets not working, ours absolutely work. We created 14 all-new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack4. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or you can grab the Grand Slam bundle that includes Fropack 1, 2, 3, and 4, and of course Skittles as part of Fropack 1 and you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. So now it's time to go through the menu system and how I personally would set it up. I'm gonna do the best job that I can do to try and explain what each of the functions are, but we might skip certain ones that we never use and you might never use yourself. But before we do all of that, this is a Atomos Ninja recorder. What's happening right now is I'm able to record my menu so that you guys can follow along at home and see exactly what I see and it's gonna match what you see most likely on the back of your camera. Now this takes away all of my touch functionality, so I can no longer touch this just like MC Hammer. I can't touch this, but I can still go through the menu system. Keep in mind, you can touch the screen but I can't because I'm plugged in right now. So when you hit the menu, this is the first thing that you see, my menu. Now there's different ways you can jump around the menu system. You can just touch it, because you can touch this, or you can rotate these dials back here. You can rotate the top dial. Nope, back dial doesn't do anything, but the front dial does do something. See, you learn something new every day. The first thing you have at the top is called My Menu. Some of the other manufacturers, not that you need to know this, put that as the very last thing, but this is an old way of putting quick things into a place where you can get to them quickly. So if I wanted to add a specific thing here, I could do it. But with the Sony cameras having so many different ways to do the same exact thing and so many custom function buttons, you really don't need to put very much into my menu at this point. That's why when you go to the next one, which is the main menu, we call it the tile menu, you have so many different options to quickly get to settings that you can change. So right now I'm arrowing over to this. I don't think you can make changes to what's in this uh, custom setting menu or in this we call it the tile menu, but you can see that you can change your shutter speed, your aperture, your exposure compensation. You can get to ISO from here. You have all of these features that you could do. Like this one right here, when I press on it, it's like this is gonna perform a quick format of my card. Now, I don't wanna hit that right now because I have images here that I've taken that I haven't offloaded, and if I do this, I will lose those images. I don't want to do that, so I go ahead and I hit cancel. But you can see what all of these different options are, but everything that's here is basically a quick menu for, for, for a lot of the things that you find over here. 
Like this is your shooting menu, where you see where it says JPEG? Well, that was the same thing that we saw right here. We can get to that. So just understand that that's there. And we're gonna go and start with the shooting menu. Now keep in mind that when I hit over once, this is one menu and I could go all the way down to 10, not 11. We like turning it to 11. But then if I wanna get into the thing on the right, you either touch it or this is another sub menu that gets you into the settings. I know it's a mouthful right there, um, but let's start right here. So this, it says JPEG, Heath as well. Uh, you could set it to Heath for, I don't use Heath. It's a new format. I don't really use JPEG either, but when you first get your camera, it's gonna be set to JPEG. I'm the guy who goes to file format when I first get a camera and I go right up to raw. I am the iShoot Raw guy, store.phronosphoto.com to get your iShoot Raw gear. iShoot Raw. Now, if you're new to this and you don't understand what RAW is, RAW is an uncompressed file where you get more data, which means it's gonna take up more room on your memory card, but more data means that you have a possibility to get better images. JPEGs are compressed. They take all of the data that the camera captures, that RAW data, and it throws out things that it doesn't think that you need. I personally think that you need the RAW file, but when you're first starting out, if you just wanna shoot in JPEG, perfectly fine. If you want to shoot in RAW plus JPEG, you could do that for a while, and that's going to make sure that you have that RAW file in case you get something you really like and you need to work on it. Now, keep in mind that a RAW file needs some extra editing, or it needs to be edited when you put it into the computer. I personally use Adobe Lightroom because that's what I use to edit and organize my files is, is, is Adobe Lightroom. So keep in mind it takes more time to edit your RAW files, but we do offer presets for pack one, two, three, and four, which help give you a great starting point and speed up your RAW workflow, especially when you're first starting out. So RAW plus JPEG is where you could totally start if you want. Now, RAW file type, there's different types. Compressed, why do I wanna throw away some data? It's still a RAW file, but it's gonna be a smaller RAW file. I don't use that. You could shoot lossless compressed large, which is going to be a compressed RAW file without losing any of the data. Uncompressed is just straight up uncompressed. It's gonna be the largest file that you get out of the camera. You could shoot in lossless compressed or uncompressed. Just remember that sometimes when you put these into your computer, if it's compressed, the computer has to uncompress it. Now this all happens in the background quickly. It has to uncompress it to then allow you to edit that file. It might slow down your editing just a little bit. So I would not shoot in lossless compressed medium or lossless compressed small personally, because remember, you can't dumb up a file, but you can dumb down a file. So if you start low, you can't go up and bring back that quality. So either lossless compressed or uncompressed is a good place to be. Now JPEG fine, if you're gonna shoot in JPEG, I suggest you use extra fine. You know, like me, I'm so fine. He's so fine, that's right, that's me. So extra fine right there. JPEG image size, you've got large, you've got medium, you've got small. For whatever reason, if you wanna go and shoot a smaller file format of JPEG, you could go ahead and do that. I'm not gonna do that. Something I should show you here, you see that trash can, AKA Oscar the Grouch can, with the question mark next to it? That means if I press the trash can while we're in the menu, it's gonna pull up an option that basically is a user guide built in. So it's saying, shoot at small, minimum size. Now that not, is not a good example of, of you know, needing information because we know exactly what it is. But if you ever see that trash can show up and you need to understand what a setting is because I didn't explain it to you fully, you could do that and maybe it still won't explain it perfectly, but it will give you a better understanding. Aspect ratio, 3-2 is what your image sensor is. So that's the shape and the size of your image sensor is 3-2. 4-3 is that old TV format. 16-9 is like a movie format. Now we're talking about stills right now. And then one-to-one -one is a square. If you are shooting JPEG and you decide to shoot 16 by nine, you're losing all of that extra data that you could capture around the outside. You're only capturing 16 by nine. If you were going to shoot in RAW, you will shoot with the 16 nine, but you will still be able to go back and get the entire three, two, format, the same frame, you'll get all of that data. So I personally leave it in 3.2 at all times because you can you can crop to a square if you want later. Um, so I stick to the 3.2 myself. Now file format for video, this is when you're shooting, uh, so okay, I'll just press the trash can this time. 
because I read this earlier. So I don't want to add it to my menu though. You could see how you could quickly add that to my menu. But in camera guide, it says, select the movie file format. Okay, thanks, that was very helpful. Um, but yeah, you're selecting the movie format uh, a basic setting for movie shooting, you can set all items when set to movie mode. That's what I was going for. That's what I was hoping it was gonna tell us in the, in the trash can mode, but this is saying that being that we're set in photos, we can still set the video quality that we want, and that's gonna take place when you press the record button, but if you wanna take full control of changing those settings, you're first gonna switch the camera into the video mode, then go into the menu mode and come back here and you can make those changes. But you can see the different file formats that you have. Obviously the top one is the HS 4K, and then as you go down, you have less quality. This is HD. So you've got 4K less quality, you've got HD, you've got 4K that's medium of the road, and then you've got the best of the best with honors, sir. Continuing down, yeah, there's a lot here. This is four of 56 options. That's what the top right hand corner is showing me. We've got movie settings. We can go in here and it says basic settings for shooting. You can set all of this when set into movie mode. I could save that for then, but you've got 24p or 60p, that's your frame rate. And then you've got your recording settings. Obviously higher is going to give you more data, take up more space on your card, but give you the best quality that you can get. Remember, it's much harder to dumb up than it is to dumb down. So let's see, a corresponding environment is required for playback of movies recorded in this format. Thank you for letting me know, camera. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit back. Moving down, this is set to auto. This is something I like to keep in auto. It says APS-C, so S35 stands for Super 35 shooting. But if you're using an APS-C lens, which is not designed specifically to cover the entire full frame sensor that you have here, it will automatically switch the mode and know that you put on a S lens and not give you any issues around the edge. It's gonna bang into APS-C mode. So this is one that you're gonna go ahead and leave in auto. Now, long exposure noise reduction is currently on. I don't like noise reduction in cameras. What this is doing is if you shoot at higher ISOs uh, or you do a long exposure in this case, it's gonna introduce some, some noise into your frame. Like it's gonna look like grain or maybe colored noise. This is just something I personally leave off because I wanna take control of this later if I want to do it. I don't want the camera making that decision. Now keep in mind that's going to affect your JPEGs over your RAW files. Now this is where it says high ISO noise reduction. You have normal, you have low, and you have off. I put this on off because I don't like, if you shoot at a higher ISO, what the noise reduction is going to do is try to smooth out your image to compensate for what it thinks is noise and it ends up looking like a mosaic or something that doesn't, or like a Gaussian blur. I don't like it. I don't like it. It looks like an, a, a, a watercolor painting. So I rather see dots of grain, not dots of Jupiter. Hmm, callback. Um, but so I leave this off. HLG still images is set to off. I can't even access this right now. Color space sRGB, that's where I leave it. We've got lens compensation. Let's see what it tells us about lens compensation in camera guide. Compensates for distortion, shift, et cetera, characteristics of the lens. So yeah, this, there's a lot of stuff being built into these cameras. Um, to correct for lens issues. Now they're not issues per se, they're imperfections that the camera manufacturers are correcting for after the fact digitally. This is stuff you couldn't do back in the film days or the early digital DSLR days. You couldn't correct for those things in camera. So now they're correcting for it and it's automatic. It's really not something you need to change. So the shading comp, auto, chromatic aberration comp, auto, and distortion comp is currently off. These are all settings that you can go in and change if you so choose to do that. Now let's go back to, hey, finally we got out of, out of one menu, now we're gonna move into number two. So number two is media under shooting. You saw that we could format the card earlier from that quick menu, from the tile menu, we would go here and it's like perform a quick format. Like I said earlier, I don't want to do that. Let me go deeper here and explain this to you. What you're doing when you get a card. So when you get a card brand new, I put it into the camera and I go and I format it. That tells the card and the camera that they're gonna talk together much better and it's erasing and starting fresh with the card. Now after you take pictures, you wanna go ahead and offload those to your computer. You also wanna back them up. Now keep in mind, a backup doesn't mean you have an external drive and that's where you put the files because one is not a backup. If you delete them from your computer and you only have it on the external, 
Well, that's one, that's not a backup. So make sure you have it stored in multiple places. Hard drives are much less expensive these days. You could have cloud storage where you store some of your images, but make sure you back things up and a backup is at least having it copied twice in different places. So I'm gonna make sure I hit cancel here because I don't want to reformat. Now, after I take all those photos off the like to the computer, make sure they're backed up, I then wanna start fresh again with that card. I put it back in and I go in and I format the card. Once again, warning, warning, make sure that you've offloaded the pictures first and that everything is safe because the last thing you wanna do is delete them. Now you've got recover image database. This is a Sony thing. I'm gonna hit the trash can anyway. Let's see what it says. Recovers the image database files for movies and enables recording and playback. This is only if it says your database has been ruined. Uh, you come into this area and it's gonna try and fix it. Display media info. Oh, this is literally just telling me what I can get with the card that I have in the camera. With raw, large, and JPEG extra fine, 33 megapixels, I'll get 1,792 images. And with video shooting in that HS4K mode, I will get two hours and 36 minutes. Keep in mind, as you fill the card with photos, you're gonna get less video. Or as you fill the card with video, you're gonna get less storage for the photos. Now you can do them both to the same card. We've got file, we've got file folder settings. I don't go in here and change anything. We've got select record photo, don't change anything there. Don't create new folder, IP, I don't even know what this one means. It's nothing that you need to know. Copyright info, this is good to have. So do we want to write copyright info? I say yes. I want to set the photographer's name. You would go in here and you would set, in my case, it would be Jared Poland Frono's photo. I'm gonna hit cancel because we're not doing that. I would set copyright as Jared Poland Frono's photo and I wanna display the copyright info. You could display it right here. Now what's happening is it's saving your name or the copyright info into the metadata of your images so that when you bring it up on the computer, unless someone decides to strip it out after the fact, it's going to be written into that file. That's a good thing to have so that you know that when you load it onto the computer, it says photo by whoever the hell you are, if that's what you wanted to have it uh, say. Now, write serial number. This should just be on all the time. I want the serial number written on all of the images just so that I know it came from my camera. It's just another thing to know that that's how you took the picture. Shooting mode. Right now, I can't go into this one to recall camera settings because I'm plugged into the camera right now. But we've got camera setting menu. Remember the one, two, and three on the top of the camera? This is where you would go and set those. So if I set my settings, I change them all over the place, and I'm like, I wanna always come back to these settings for the, if I change 57 different things, I could set this to one. Right, so when I turn the dial to one, it will always go back to the settings that I locked in here. You can do the same thing for two and three. M1, M2, M3, and M4, they're not BMWs. This is a digital version, so you can have even more menu settings that you can lock in so that you can quickly change it. One of the things that you could do is if you shoot video and you wanna quickly get into a 4K HQ or whatever you wanted to, you could set that a specific way and you can jump into there quickly. That stuff is really powerful and really good to know that you have it. Next, we've got register custom shoot set. Great English right there. Um, recall custom one, recall custom two, recall custom hold three. This is activated by a specific button that you would set to get to something quickly. So you would press that button and it would take you right into here. The Sony's give you so much usability and so many custom settings that you can do. It can become overwhelming. Next, we've got drive mode. Now keep in mind, you don't have to always dive this deep into the menu. You have those quick functions, the, the tiles, the swipes to the left, the swipes up. There's a lot of ways to do the same thing. Even custom buttons are set on the back of the camera, like this right here on the back of the camera where it shows you multiple frames. If I was to hit the over button on the back of the camera to the left, it would bring up the same drive mode features that I'm about to show you right now. So you've got drive mode. Right now it's on single shot. Single shot means when I take a picture, press the button, it's only gonna take one picture. If I was to go ahead and go to high, this is where you can go to uh, shoot rapid fire. Here, I'll show you. You ready? Oh boy, lots of pictures. Now I'm gonna go ahead and hit this to the left to show you that it brings up the same thing we just had, custom shooting drive mode. You've got high plus is going to shoot the fastest, high, just regular high is a little low, you've got middle, you've got low. So that's 
for shooting super duper fast or super slow. Generally it's in H plus or H, but if you know you just wanna take one picture at a time, you go here, we press the button halfway down, press it all the way, and I'm holding it, I'm only getting one picture every time I take the picture. So, and you can see it saving. We'll get to the menu. We'll, we'll show you all that a little bit later, but that's how you go ahead and do that. Next, you've got bracket shooting. Now, this is something as you get more advanced. If you wanted to say, take a picture at the right exposure, then it's gonna do one underexposed, one overexposed. This is where you would go in to set those settings. Bracket shooting means it's gonna take multiple images, but sometimes at slight different settings, to either give you the best results or maybe you could smush them together later in Lightroom to help you make a HDR style image. Way back in the day, we used to shoot bracketed if we weren't sure what the proper exposure would be so that it would shoot one over, one under, and one that it thinks is properly exposed so that the hope was that you got something exposed properly. Let me jump in here and say, would you like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations? Well, if you said yes, head on over to fronosphoto.com, look for this orange box, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Next up, we've got the interval shooting functions, or as I like to call it, the intervalometer. This is where you could have, you would turn interval shooting on, and it would say shoot start one second, and then shoot interval every three seconds. Basically, you shoot, and then every three seconds, it's gonna take another picture. So this is how you could do some time lapse with still images, but you could dive super deep and say, I want to shoot 30 images. I could want it to keep shooting all day. You can do that as long as you have enough power, and that's where that USB-C plug comes in handy. Next, we've got silent mode settings. So this camera has the ability to shoot without making any sound, even when you take the picture. You heard when I took the picture, you heard a shutter come down, you heard a noise. Well, you can also turn it in to silent shooting. Right now, silent shooting is currently off. Target function settings. We've got aperture drive is currently set to standard. We've got shutter when powered off. What that means, if we turn this on, every time we turn the camera off, the shutter is gonna come down and come over that image sensor that I showed you earlier that you don't wanna touch. Now, you also don't wanna touch the shutter. If you damage the shutter, you're damaging the camera, and that's something you wanna be very careful with. I actually don't turn this on because I change lenses quite a bit, and when I turn the camera off to change lenses, it slows me down because that shutter has to come back down and it's not exactly instant, so I leave that off. Auto pixel mapping is another thing I don't touch at all. So let's go to number two. We've got shutter type here. We've got mechanical shutter. You heard that earlier. You have the option to go to electronic shutter. That's where you're gonna shoot completely silent. But going into complete silent shooting, you would do that in a situation where you can't make any noise. But if you're at a concert, you're at an event where noise is happening, there's no benefit to your shooting speed by shooting silent or mechanical over the other. You're gonna get the same 10 frames per second with the shutter and with the electronic, either way you go. But you also have to keep in mind, and this is very basic, that if you're gonna be shooting fast moving action with the electronic shutter, you might see the background warble a little bit when it comes to, say, stanchions when I'm shooting a hockey game, which I've done with a Sony camera in silent. You can see how the stanchions look like they're not straight. That's because I'm getting some jelloing effect of the rolling shutter. If you were to try to shoot a ball, baseball, basketball, football, something moving fast with the electronic shutter, there's a good possibility it's gonna look like it's warped. So keep, in, keep that in mind if you're gonna use silent electronic shooting. Now, if you're using it in a situation where people aren't moving or the subject isn't really moving, not gonna be an issue at all. Release without the lens is currently enabled. So if I didn't have the lens on this camera, I could, for some reason, take pictures. I don't wanna do that. So I'm gonna go ahead and disable that because I don't wanna shoot without a lens on here. Same with the release of the card. I don't wanna take pictures without a card in the camera, so I'm gonna disable that. I can no longer take pictures if there isn't a card in the camera. That is a mode that should just be automatic. Next up, we have anti-flicker setting. This is important. So do you know when you're in a gymnasium and they still have those terrible sodium vapor metal halide lights and you take a picture and part of it is dark and part of it's light, that's because you got both the flick and the er in the shot. And this will help you get the flick and not the er, or the er and the flick, whichever way you want it to go. But they take it deeper. So this is something that is pretty good to have on most of the time, especially if you're in a weird lighting situation. It might slow down your shooting ever so slightly because the camera is doing its best possible job of not shooting when there's a flicker thing happening. 
but if you really need to dial it in, and it's kind of amazing that Sony put it into this camera, is the variable shutter speed. So this is, if I turn this on, I'm gonna be able to shoot at shutter speeds that are between, like, so no longer would be like one eight hundredth of a second. I could shoot at one eight, 23.57th of a second. We've got an example on the screen running right now where there's a lot of flickering light and I couldn't just use anti-flicker to make it work. So I had to go into variable shutter and I was able to dial it in and it gets rid of the flicker altogether. Now keep that in mind. This is a setting that's very powerful. That is something that you could use to get the same results that I got right there. Next, we move on to image stabilization. Steady shot is currently on. This camera offers you stabilized shooting. So your image sensor can actually counterbalance your movement, which is great. So we want to leave that on. Next, we've got steady shot adjust. You keep this in auto because this is gonna tell the camera what lens you're using and it's gonna talk to each other and give you the best stabilization possible. Next up, we've got Zoom. And no, this isn't taking a phone call on Zoom, doing a conference call. This is something that if you get a little bit more into video, you're gonna wanna dive in here and play with this. Uh, you're able to say, zoom in on a video with digital zoom if you set a certain custom function button. So I'm not gonna go through here right now because this dives in much deeper than anything you need right now. And we're gonna go on to shooting display. Now, where you see that there's an icon that shows a camera and a video camera, stills camera and videos camera, that means it's going to change that for both. So grid display is currently off. This is if you want kind of like a checkerboard on your screen while you're looking through your camera to help you get your lines right or to help you just frame things and compose them. You could put that on. I don't use it. I know Steven likes using it when he's shooting video because it helps him out, but I personally don't do that. The grid line type, it could be set to rule of thirds. It could be a square grid. It could be a digital, uh, sorry, a diagonal plus a square grid, which gets a little confusing in this in the frame i don't set that to anything at all live view display settings you've got live view display set effects settings effects on you've got exposure effect is the exposure is set this is what you see when you're looking through the electronic viewfinder here let, let me give you a quick example i'm going to change my settings here you see how it's getting darker it's giving me a live simulation of my exposure right in front of me as I look through the camera. So if you get something and it's like super bright or super dark, you know that it's not perfect. So you can change it, but the simulation is great to be able to see that. So I, I make sure that is always on. Um, frame, frame rate, low limit, I leave off as well. And then finally, the last in the shooting menu is marker display. Aspect marker is currently off. Now, if we were to turn this on and say we were shooting in the square mode, it will black out the left and the right side, and just show you the square. So you would set that. I don't play with this at all because I like to shoot in the two, three all together. But that takes us through the shooting menu. And the next one we're gonna hit is the exposure slash color magenta menu. Number one under exposure, the first thing we have is bulb timer settings. So for those who don't know what bulb is, it's when you press your finger fully down on the shutter button, and as long as your finger is pressed down, the shutter stays open. This is something that you would use if you're trying to capture lightning or some super long exposure. That's what's called bulb setting. We're not gonna dive too deep into that right now. ISO, you saw that there's been like 15 menus and 15 ways to get the ISO already, but this is the one deep inside of the menu. Menu. It is currently set to auto ISO. Now, I'm not a fan of using auto ISO, but when you're first starting out, it's probably not a bad place to be, but in the future, you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna jump out of that so that you can take full control of your settings. So here's auto ISO. Let me explain to you this. ISO 100 is considered the base ISO, even though you see that you have 80, 64, and 50. These with lines under them are the not authorized by the engineers. They're there, but they say that the 100 is the cleanest and where they feel that it's the best. And you won't see major issues if you go lower than that. I tend not to go lower into the line under ones, but 100 is something that you would use when you're in a super bright situation. And then as you raise your ISO, it's as it's darker. If you're in a darker light situation, you're gonna raise that ISO. Now keep in mind, as you hit 5,000 and 6,400 and 8,000 and 10,000 and 12,800 and beyond, you might start introducing more noise and grain into your images. Now, some people will say use noise reduction software. Even if you don't know what that is right now, just don't buy it. 
Don't buy anything that someone tries to sell you that's like, you need to clean up your noise. No, you, you don't. Grain is okay in your images. And if you get your exposure pretty damn close, you don't have to worry about the grain as much. Grain is natural. We had it with film. You'll continue to have it with digital as a, a form of digital noise, but it's really not that big of a deal that you should spend money on a software to strip that out and make it look soft and crappy. That's what I have to say about that. Anyway, I'm just gonna select an ISO right now. We could always change that on the fly. I told you the back dial. We talked about this dial being set to ISO. We could change that and allow us to change ISO from there or ISO right here on this right pad, you would hit right and then that would bring up the ISO and then you would turn this back dial to change the ISO while you're looking through the camera. Now ISO range limit is an interesting thing. It's where you can say, I don't want it to go, say we don't want it at a minimum of 100, Let's say we don't want it to go ever below 400, or we don't want a maximum of anything over 32, no, screw that. We don't want anything over 12,800. Now the auto ISO will not go below 400 or above 12,800. So I think that makes sense. I'm not an auto ISO fan, but when you're first starting out, it's not a bad place to be. Next up, we have exposure compensation. This is for if you're in auto ISO and you wanna brighten or darken because you feel like, oh, I just want it to be a little brighter, you would expose a little bit more with your exposure compensation or on the dark side, Darth Vader, you would pull it down just a little bit, say negative 0.3, and then that would be the compensation that you go. Here's the exposure steps. You could do it in 0.5 or you could do it in 0.3. 0.3 EV is a little better. An exposure standard adjustment. Let's see. This function adjusts the standard of optimum exposure. Generally, adjustment is not necessary. Adjust? No, it's not necessary. So we're not going to go ahead and adjust it. Metering. Back in the day, metering was a bigger deal than it is now. Remember when I showed you earlier in the video that you could, as you raise the exposure or drop the exposure, it got brighter or darker in your viewfinder? Well, you are seeing a representation of, your, of the proper exposure. So you don't really need to rely on the meter as much. I sometimes look at the meter, those are the hash marks down at the bottom of the screen where it's either plus three or minus three or right in the middle. It's still you know, good to know it, but it's not integral to what you're doing today as much. So. You've got multi, which is gonna take a reading, the average reading of the entire scene to give you your exposure. You've got center weighted, which is just gonna take the exposure of something more in the middle. Then you've got spot metering. There's this spot standard right now. That's a very small spot. So if you're gonna photograph a person and say they're in front of something super bright and you don't want it to get thrown off by the brightness of the background, you would use spot metering there or you just look at the viewfinder while you're shooting pictures and be like, I don't want it this bright in the background because you just know how to use your gear. So you also have an entire screen average as well as highlight metering mode. At the end of the day, this isn't affecting you that much if you're shooting in manual because you have it right in front of you. If you're in the auto modes, you might want to change the different metering because if you're not happy with what you're getting, the results that you're getting because it's being thrown off and you're not taking control, then maybe you want to go in and do this. Or maybe you want to learn the fundamentals and basics. That takes time. I get it, it takes time to learn. I mean, I didn't get out of the auto modes for like the first five or six years of shooting film back in the day. But when I did, and nowadays, I've got full control of the camera and I know exactly what I'm doing. Just understand this takes time. It's not gonna happen overnight. So I'm just gonna go ahead and put it back up to multi. Now we've got face priority in multi metering. That is currently on. We've got spot metering point for the center. That's where we want the spot to be in the center. Auto exposure lock with shutter is set to auto and I go ahead and leave that on auto. Next, we move over to the flash. If you're gonna put a flash on the camera, then this is the setting, you're gonna go into here if you wanna control your flash. There is no flash built into this camera. We're gonna skip over this because it's not important right now since you're just getting started. And it's more important to understand the fundamentals and basics of photography with natural light before you get into flash. Just try to get an understanding first. And I'm not saying don't move into flash, move into that when you have that original understanding. Because if, under, if you don't understand exposure, for natural light, it's gonna be even more difficult to understand exposure for artificial light, meaning flashes or strobes. White balance. So white balance is currently set to auto. 
Um, when we go in here, you have a lot of different options. If you're gonna be shooting JPEG, your white balance is going to affect the JPEG. It doesn't affect the RAW, meaning you can change it after the fact with the RAW, but if you bake it in with the JPEG, it's much more difficult to do. So it's currently set to auto white balance. You also have one for daylight, shade, cloudy, incandescence, you have uh, fluorescent light, warm white, you have all these different fluorescent day white, so many different options. White balance for flash. If you're using flash, you put on the flash white balance. Look, is that a is that a underwater auto? That's interesting that it has auto white balance for underwater. Don't take your camera underwater though, unless you have a housing for it. So you can see there's a lot of different options, including being able to set custom color temperatures um, that you can take control. Like we are using a specific temperature in here. I believe it's 5,600 degrees Kelvin, which means we're setting the camera that we're filming with to 5,600 degrees for our white balance to make sure that it's exactly the same. So generally speaking, I personally leave it on auto because I am shooting raw. Priority set and auto white balance is set to standard. I leave it there. We've got shutter auto white balance lock is currently off and I leave that off as well. Number six, we've got color and tone. Now we've got D range optimizer. Now keep in mind that most of these settings are only affecting the JPEG. So we're gonna leave it on auto, which is on. Next, we've got creative look. This is basically considered to be your picture style. So if you're shooting portraits, you maybe wanna put it in portrait mode, but keep in mind this affects the JPEG once again. So there is an option here to change your, your style to something called black and white. Now, if you shoot in black and white and you shoot JPEG, you're only gonna get a black and white image. That's what you're gonna save, a JPEG that's black and white. If you go to black and white and you're shooting in RAW, then you're gonna have the black and white image come into the computer, but the color data is still there if you wanted to use it and go back to it. I'm not a fan of shooting in black and white at all. I love black and white. I shot a lot of film back in the day with black and white, and I love converting images to black and white later with my RAW files because I have more control over it. Picture style is very important to make sure that if you're shooting the JPEGs, that you don't overdo the sharpening. You don't go in there and max sharpening the 9,000 or nine, whatever it gives you, and then your image looks over sharp. You can't underdo it. You can't take it out of the oven once it's already been burnt. You can't go back on it. So I think standard for most of it is pretty good. Um, of course, you have vivid options too, but when you're first starting out, standard is gonna be perfectly fine then you wanna take more control if you're gonna stay in JPEGs. I'm shooting raw, so it doesn't really matter. Now keep in mind that if you do change your picture style here, it's also going to affect your video. So if you shoot video in black and white, it's always gonna be video in black and white because you can't change it after the fact. There's another thing that I wanna show you is that you have more fine tuning control here, much more so than Canon. You can go in here and be like, oh, I wanna do more contrast, or I wanna add more highlights or take away shadows, fade. That's if you wanna get one of those sweet fade haircuts. You got saturation, sharpness is the one that you do not wanna max out to nine. If you max that out to nine, you're gonna be very disappointed. Remember, affecting your JPEGs, affecting your video, not affecting your RAW file. So you can change this, you can make it custom for how you like to shoot, and then you can go ahead and lock it in there and hit save. We've got picture profile, that is for shooting when you're shooting video. You've got the soft skin effect. Let's read you what this one says. Sets levels of, uh, to, of soft skin effect, thank you. Uh, I think we'll never need to go into the, this anymore because it doesn't explain us anything. Basically, there's an option in here to soften skin in the camera. It's not something I recommend doing. We have presets from Fropac 4 that are gonna be better for editing the face and the body and the eyes and the skin. It's gonna be much better than baking it in in the camera. That's not something I recommend that you do. Now, we're gonna to go to zebra displays, and zebra displays can affect your photos as well as video, because we have both of those icons there. It's currently off, but the zebra lines are there to help you see what you, when your exposure is so far off that it has zebra lines saying that you do not have any detail there, that it's so overexposed that there is no detail in there. 
Next, we've got zebra levels. That you're gonna set and it's gonna help determine where you're actually clipping. Steven just told me that he likes to put it at 95 when he does it. I don't use zebras because I don't shoot video, uh, but you can use it for stills if you so choose to wanna use it for stills. Let me jump in here and say, please hit that subscribe button. If you're enjoying this video, let us know by giving it a thumbs up and leaving a comment down below. But don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss the fun and informative videos that I put out every week. We're now into the purple menu, which is the focus menu. So again, all this stuff is on the outside of the camera. You can get there quick. We've got auto focus to manual focus. Let's go into that. We've got focus mode is currently set to automatic focus. You have single shot AF, you have automatic AF, continuous AF, DMF, and it's not DMX. Do not mistake it for DMX. <laughs> and manual focus. So single shot AF means when you press the button halfway down and you hear the beep, it's locking the focus in as long as your finger is pressed on the shutter halfway down. Uh, next is automatic AF. That's where the camera is gonna decide should it be in single shot AF or is it, should it do continuous? I wanna choose the one that I want. If I'm shooting an object that's not moving, I may put it into single shot uh, or where I'm at 99.9999% of the time is on continuous autofocus, where when we go in here and we press the button halfway down, it's going to continuously focus. Let me, let me take this off and show you that. See, my finger is pressed halfway down and you can see that the focus is constantly moving. Let me change my exposure so you can see it better. You can see one of our sets in the background, but you see how my finger is pressed halfway down and it's continually focusing. I get here on my leg, you see how it's focusing there over here? Focusing? Yeah, because my finger's pressed halfway down. Now, if we were to go back in here and go into single AF, watch. See, it's locked and it's not moving. I come to my leg, it's not going to change the focus. I have to lock and recompose, I have to lock and refocus right there. And then here on the background, I have to go ahead and do the same exact thing. So that's why I like to use continuous when I am changing my focus. Uh, so yeah. I leave that on continuous. DMF is where you can have it in autofocus, but you can then still move the manual focus ring and have it focus. Now, most of the time, you're never gonna need to touch the manual focus ring, but this gives you the option that you could override that autofocus with the DMF. And manual focus, of course, is if you wanna go ahead and manually focus. But continuous AF is where I live most of the time. Now, priority set in AFS. Now, AFS is single uh, focus, and that is set to balanced emphasis. Let me go in here and I explain this to you. Balanced emphasis says this, and this is confusing, shoots an image composed of a balance between a photo shot at the right timing and focus. You know someone um, that speaks English as a first language didn't write this when this is what it says. Uh, balanced emphasis is what I like to use because it's not gonna shoot the picture if it's completely out of focus. But when it comes to continuous AF or priority set in AF continuous, I like to do release because sometimes it's in focus and I know it's in focus and it should be taking the picture. Whereas if I didn't have it set to that or I had it set to focus, it would be like, well, it's not in focus. I can't take a picture. Sometimes when you're shooting action, you just need it to take pictures and the autofocus will still keep up and you'll get the shot. So I like to leave that on release. AF tracking sensitivity. Now, if you want it to be super responsive on the subject, meaning it's gonna stay, uh, if we go to five responsive, if I'm tracking a subject right in front of me and something crosses, if it's super sensitive and super responsive, uh, responsive, it might just catch that new subject that runs by. Or if it's a subject that I know I wanna stay locked on, like a tennis player in the distance, not the one in the foreground, well then I would go to lock on and it would say locked on them longer while your fingers press halfway down. You could always just take your finger off and then pick another subject and focus on them. So standard is not a bad place to be. AF illuminator, that was that thing I told you about earlier on the front of the camera, that LED that comes on and it's orange, it's a distraction. Let's turn it off. It's not exactly gonna help you focus because it's so small anyway, it's not lighting up anything at a distance. Aperture drive in AF, I leave this on standard, and then AF with shutter is currently on. Yeah, what that means is when I press the shutter halfway down, it is going to autofocus. There are some videos out there and there's some photographers out there that tell you that back button focus is the way to go. That is 
This right here, that is the AF on button. That's considered your back button. I'm not a fan of that. I've never been a fan of that. And especially with the technologies that we have today, it's really not worth using back button focus. Anything else in there? We've got full-time DMF is currently off. So you could turn that on. So you could always go ahead and uh, change the focus with the manual ring. And then we've got pre-AF pre is off. Pre-AF is terrible. That means it's gonna continue to auto-focus non-stop no matter where you point this thing. It's a distraction. No pro in their right mind would ever use that. Number two in purple, we've got focus area. So this is a pretty deep menu again, cause Sony likes to go deep on this stuff. Focus area is currently set to wide. This, oh my God, there's a lot here. You've got wide zone, center fixed, spot metering, expanded spot, and my favorite is tracking expanded spot, or tracking small, tracking medium, tracking large. I generally say in tracking large or tracking medium. This, I'm gonna use Steven as an example here, Steven. I know you're gonna love it, but let me just show you. We, with the new technologies here, stick your head out a little bit. You see how it's, uh, let me change my exposure. You see how it's finding his eye? You see how it's finding his face right there? That's what we're looking for. Why would we wanna be in any other mode that doesn't lock on and track onto the face? Now I have human most likely set right now. You could change it to animals and do this, but you see how it's set to his eye and it's finding it? This is why you have this technology. So I'm not sure why you would wanna use any other mode. I mean, yeah, there's times you would use those other modes, but that just gives you the best results, especially if you're tracking subjects. Now, if there's a person and you don't want the person, you want an object, that's when you would switch into some of these other modes like focus area, medium, you would switch that. But again, on the back of the camera, you have these options that you could quickly get into it by changing those modes. You would hit the function button and it would bring up the back and you would be able to change those modes quickly. This is, this is an intense one, but I leave it on that tracking. We've got focus area limiter. This is just changing those options. Like if I don't need this one, I don't need this one, I don't want this one, maybe I don't need any of these, I would go ahead and hit okay and those options would no longer show up. So if there's only a few of these that you like to use, like I was saying, you could just leave those active and those are the only ones that will show up as icons so you can quickly make that change. Now we've got switch vertical to horizontal AF area. I leave that off. If you were to put that on, the focusing points would switch. When you go vertical, it's gonna move it to the same similar spot. I just find that to be unnecessary, so I leave it off. Next, we've got focus area color. It's currently set to white. I like seeing it red in the viewfinder because I find that it's much easier to see, so I put it on red. AF area registration, I leave off. Uh, I'm not registering any of the AF points because sometimes if there's a point that you like to use the most, the top leftist mostest point, you could set that to a button. I mean, you could set that to a custom button on the lens to pull that, pull that up if you wanted to. Say you always wanted to take you back to the center, you could have press that and register that and hit the button and it will take you back to the center. Uh, AF area auto clear is currently off as well. Oh my God, this menu runs deep. We're on the second page of this menu. Next, we've got area display during tracking is set to off. So the focusing point that I have selected, maybe in this case, you can see that red box, that is not going to, not gonna stay on the screen when it's focusing on Steven, it's gonna disappear. And if you want that to stay on the screen, you would just go ahead and turn it on. That is a personal preference. Now AF uh, C area display is currently on, I leave that on. Phase detect area, I also leave that off. We've got circle of focus points. Ah, does not circulate. So what that means is if you are controlling focusing points, now we don't do a lot of controlling focusing points anymore because the camera is so damn smart that it knows basically where we want it to go. And I trust it more than I trust me moving focusing points because it's so much quicker. But what this means is if it was active and you pushed it all the way to the right, it would end up all the way on the left. Or you go all the way up, it will end up at the bottom because it will just keep circulating. I do actually leave that on when I'm uh, doing different focusing points, I sometimes leave that on. Next, we've got AF frame movement amount is set to standard. This is how quickly or slower, slower you can move the box that's on the screen. Sometimes we want it to move large, so we go ahead and put it there. Subject recognition, we've got subject recognition is on. This is where I talked about human. We saw that it recognized Steven as a subject. Then we've got recognized target. You've got human, you've got animals, 
animal slash bird. I don't know what's different between animal bird, but you got insects, cars and trains and airplanes. Amazing how many different options you have. So make sure you go in there and you set this uh, based off of what you, wow. It even has more sensitivity range in here that it can find it wider or narrower. It, this, this runs deep. This runs super deep. Look at this, even under birds and, and, and animals, you could sit here and go even more. I like recognition priority set to auto. Um, recognition, it can, you can select, do you want it to be the eye, the head, the body? Do you only want it to find the eye or the head, the eye, or do you want to follow the individual? This is crazy how deep you can go in here and change all of these settings. Animal detail settings, this, I'm not gonna go through here and set all this. Most of this I'm gonna leave on standard, but you can see how much control you can have over the human or the animals. Funny is you have more control over animals than you do have over humans. Heading back out, you would make, make sure that if you're shooting a human, and by shooting I mean photographing, you're set to human. After you photograph an animal, I've made this mistake before, I haven't changed it back to human, which is what I usually photograph. So warning, make sure you remind yourself to make that change back to the people you're going to photograph. Recognize tracking uh, select set. So if we don't wanna have animal or bird or insects as an option or trains and airplanes, you could just turn them off and they won't be an option that it shows you at all. Right and left eye select is currently set to auto. This is which eye it's going to detect. Generally, it's going to go for the closer eye to you and do that, but you could go in here and say, oh, I want it to take priority over the right eye or priority over to the left eye. Or in my cat's case, who only has one eyeball, you would only select the one eyeball that it has. Because Mr. Kitty, by the name of Sammy Davis Jr. Kitty, only has one eye. So auto is generally a good place to be. We've got face memory. That's so it can remember someone's face. I've never messed with that. I've never set that. Uh, registration for face priority is set to on. This is another thing that I personally have never set or used, so I just leave it exactly where it's at. Auto magnification in manual focus. This is interesting that if you want, if you're gonna do manual focus and you go and you turn the focusing ring, it's going to magnify that on your screen to help you focus it, and it's also not gonna help you get your composition right. So not really a, a mode that I personally use. We've got focus magnifying time. There's no limit for that. You can, you can go in here and change it to five seconds, two seconds, and it can go off or you can reset it. Uh, initial focus magnification can be set to one or 6.9, nice. You also have the option for AF in focus magnification, meaning if you're magnified all the way in, it will do continuous autofocus. That's something, I, just, I leave it on on, I don't personally use it. We've got peaking display, it's not peaking duck, it's peaking, uh, currently it's off. If you're gonna be in manual focus, peaking is where you get red lines and red stuff around your subjects, and the more they are in focus, the more the red line shows up. So that's something that you would use more so in video. But today, guys, with, manual, with, with how good the autofocus is, most of the time you're gonna stick to that. But it is nice that these cameras do help you with manual focus if you ever do need to pull focus. And I thought of this all by myself. I just remembered that if you're someone that's putting manual focus lenses on this camera, older manual focus lenses, the focus peaking is certainly gonna help you out quite a bit. Uh, uh, peaking level is set to uh, middle. <laughs> that's high, middle, and low. So I'm gonna set it to middle. And we got peaking color is white. I kind of like peaking to be red just because red is better there. And that takes us out of the focusing menu and we move on to playback menu. We've got playback target. I don't touch this. You've got magnification so you can enlarge the image. Uh, how far do you want it to go? Enlarge image magnification is set to standard or previous. Standard is perfectly fine. Enlarge initial position, I love this. This is great. So when you do choose to uh, zoom in, it's gonna zoom in on the focus position. So if you focus on someone's eye and it's in the top left hand or top right hand corner, it's gonna zoom in to where the focusing point is. It's also a good way that you could know sometimes if your focus was in the wrong spot because it's gonna zoom in on the wrong spot. For example, let me hit the playback button, which is right here on the back of the camera. We're gonna go in here. Remember I told you about the sub menu because that magnifying glass is right there. I hit the AF on, it's gonna zoom in to where the focusing point is and we get nice and close to Steven. 
And then we hit the center OK button, brings us back out, and then I can go back into the menu once again. So that's definitely something that comes in handy. Selection memo, we don't touch this. Delete photos, I don't delete any photos on the camera. I don't do any editing in the camera. Uh, viewing, continu continuous playback, playback speed, slideshow, I leave these all where they're set. And playback options, we've got image index, you could show nine or 30 images. Display as a group is currently on. This is important. So if you're gonna take seven, eight, nine, ten 10 photos in a row, it's going to display that as a group, meaning you go in there and you have to hit okay to then cycle through those images. I personally turn that off. I don't wanna see a group of images here. So if I took a bunch of shots in a row in rapid fire, which we did here, you see that? They're all separate. But if I go back into the menu and I do display as group is on, you see that's what it looks like. Then I have to hit the OK button in and then I can go through the different images in the group. It might come in handy if you're shooting a ton of images, but I personally wanna go through them myself. Next, we've got display rotation is set to auto. So I'm gonna leave that on auto. We've got focus frame display, I leave that off. Aspect marker, I don't touch this stuff. Display, nope. Nope, and image jump settings. So if you wanna quickly jump, you can see, you can use these different dials to jump one by one, or you could be like, you know what, with the front dial, I wanna jump 10 images in one fell swoop. That comes in handy if you're trying to jump through images and they're not all stacked together. So that, yep, that takes us out of the playback menu and now puts us into the networking menu. Now, I'm not gonna dive too deep here. If you have the application on your phone to control your camera, you can download that app and this is where you would go in and set up a smartphone connection. This is also something that the higher end photographers are gonna use when they're transferring files and transferring data, but you go through this entire network menu to set that up. I'm not gonna go through that because not everybody is gonna to wanna to set that up. There are other videos on that, that, that Sony has that will help you set that up simply but this is where you go to set that up. You can see FTP transfers, they're streaming. If you're gonna be, that's something I should show you. You could use USB streaming here. You can go into this mode to do that. You can turn Wi-Fi on and off. You got your Bluetooth, wireless LAN connection, USB LAN tethering. There's lots of options here, but this is more in depth. And then of course, network options. You can go into airplane mode, turn that off if you want. I never go on, if I'm on an airplane, I don't exactly turn all of this off. But if you're not gonna use the Wi-Fi and you're not gonna use the Bluetooth, you might as well turn it off to save a little bit of juice. Now we're moving into the final menu, which doesn't have a lot at all. It has 13 different choices, 13. Thank you, Sony, for making this so complicated. Um, we've got area, number one, area and date. So this is where you would set your language. If it's English, you leave it on English. If it's Spanish, you get the point. We've got area, date, time, settings. So area setting, this is where we are in Bogota, Bogota, Colombia, to be exact. So that's the time zone that we're in. Daylight savings is currently off. We've got day, time. You go in here to set all of that. Real simple, real easy. This is the day and time that we're, is that correct? Let's see, the 15th at, yeah, pretty darn close. I think it's one minute off from my Apple Watch. We've got the date format. You can see how it's all gonna be represented on the bottom of the screen. Going back in, NTSC or PAL selector. We know that in the United States, they use NTSC. In other countries, they use the PAL format. That's where you would change that. Number two, we've got reset or save settings. So if you wanna reset the camera and delete everything that we just went through putting together, you could do that. Now save load settings is interesting. Um, if you have multiple cameras, you can set up one of them, save a file right here to the card, the SD card, put that into the other camera and then put the same settings on to that camera. Now you might wanna change the file naming sequence so that when you take pictures, you don't end up with file one and file one on both and then you have trouble bringing it into the computer. But also some people will ask, why can't we just give you the settings that we do here? And that's because as firmware changes, if you're watching this four years down the road, our settings might not work for you anymore. Also, it's a good idea that you email yourself the settings, right? Set up your camera, then save the file to the SD card, put it on your computer, email it to yourself, just in case you ever lose any of your settings and you wanna go back to that, you can always go back to the email and pull it back. Then you can reload it. So that is a good idea. We've got oper uh, operation customize. Okay, 
Holy deep. Man, you got 13 deep and then you got another freaking 15 layers in this one. Um, custom key dial set. This is where, let's see, don't show this again. In the next setting screen, you can check the function assigned to a specific button by pressing the button on the device. Really? That's pretty cool. So what's interesting here, it shows us white balance, right? It shows us that it's a custom setting, the C1 button. So if I wanna change it, so the way that I change it is I press the C1 button, or no, I hit OK, and then it takes me into the menu system where I could say, oh, I want this to be something else, like metering. I could have the metering button be that C1 button, and then you can lock it in. That is really smart and really nicely done. So it just highlights which one it is and shows you how you can make the change. Same thing here, if I don't want this to be ISO, I could hit the OK button and be like, I don't want it to be ISO, I want it to be auto ISO minimum shutter speed. So now every time I hit the right arrow, it's gonna be that, but I'm gonna change it back to ISO because I don't wanna go back and redo all of this. This is all self-explanatory. This is for what that button does on the lens. This is great. This is what the dials do. So yeah, let's go to that back dial that is currently set to exposure comp. I don't want it to be exposure comp. I want it to be set to ISO. So I would have to go into exposure and ISO. Now this back dial, this one that I talked about earlier, is now custom set to ISO. That is just so much quicker. You've got three dials, you might as well put this one to ISO unless you use exposure compensation more often. So that's cool. Custom key set for video, same thing. I'm not gonna go through it, but it's gonna show you what the custom buttons are when it comes for video. Custom key setting for the playback button. It's just the same thing, showing you all the options while you're in playback, what you could make the change for. Really simple. Function button, so the FN menu settings. So look at all the different settings you have. This is what comes up when you hit the FN button. You can go in here and say, oh, I don't need JPEG size, so I can totally change that to shooting mode and put shooting mode there, right? Self-explanatory, you can go in and set this yourself so that when you hit the function button, just like this, and now you can see that is all there. Really simple, you can make the change and you can go and control whatever you want. Let me jump in here real quick and let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. If you're looking to build your very own online portfolio to share your images with the world that you're in control of, use what I've been using for close to 15 years now for my personal website, I use Squarespace. I use it because it's simple, easy, affordable, and I don't need to know any coding. To get your 14-day free trial, head on over to squarespace.com slash photo if you decide that it's for you, use the code FRONOSPHOTO at checkout to get 10% off your first order. So you can see all of the different options you have here. Record with shutter, so that, I said that earlier, if we wanted the shutter button to, when you press it, record video, you could make that change. Next up, we've got dial customization. There's not a ton that I changed that I couldn't have already done in the function menu that I just showed you guys. So you can see how easy it is to select what's right for you. What's great about this camera is it's already has a lot, it already has a lot of dedicated buttons that do what they need to do. Whereas some other cameras, there aren't as many custom function buttons and you have to go in there and decide and pick and choose and tweak what you want. But the fact that I can change the dial, I can change this record button, I can change the shutter button, whatever you wanna do, you have that ability to go in and do. Now touch operation, if you don't wanna use the touch screen, you could turn it off totally. So you could just go ahead and hit off. Touch panel and the pad, this is for touch pad only or both. I'm gonna jump down to touch pad settings real fast. This is if you wanted to take control of your focusing points and use the back of the screen to move your thumb on it to move focusing points. That's how we used to do it before we had such smart autofocus, but you really don't need this to be on. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it off for now. Um, the couple of these settings that I went past, touch operation being on means you have the functionality to touch the screen. I still can't touch it, but I'm plugged in, you can touch it here. You've got touch panel or pad, you've got touch panel only, but check this one out. You've got touch panel settings. There is so much here. Your shooting screen, when you go into there, you've got shooting screen on, you've got footer icon touch is on, you've got swipe right, swipe left, swipe up. These are all the different options 
that you can dive into to change what happens when you swipe with the panel. I'm gonna leave that for you to go in there because even when I'm using cameras like this, I barely use the swipes because there is so much I can do from the function, the FN menu, as well as the buttons that I already set for myself. So I don't need to go into that too much. We've got accessibility, screen reader. Ah, so if you wanna enlarge the screen because you have trouble seeing it, you could do that and it will help you read in those situations. We've got finder and monitor. Select finder monitor is set to auto. That is where the switching happens from either using the display, the LCD display, or your electronic viewfinder, you set it to auto. But if you wanted it to be viewfinder only or monitor only, you could leave it so that they will only stay on and nothing else. Monitor brightness, we have it currently set to manual, but where you want your monitor is exactly right in the middle. You want it to be middled out because the last thing you wanna do is make it super bright on a bright day and it throws off your exposure if you're using that. Now, viewfinder brightness, I can't select it because I'm plugged into an external recorder right now, but you'll be able to select this, and I think viewfinder uh, brightness should always be set to auto, uh, just because that's gonna give you the best, closest representation of the proper exposure. If you mess around too much with it, you make it too dark or too bright, and you're like, oh, this is two stops off, and you correct two stops, you're gonna be off by a lot, so auto is the best. Finder color temperature, I leave exactly where it's set. Display quality, standard is fine. We got frame rate for the finder. You have standard or you could set that even higher frame rate if you would like. We got monitor flip direction is when you flip the monitor out, it's gonna automatically change. So if you're in selfie mode, it's instead of you being upside down, it's going to put you right side up. Number eight is display options. I'm skipping most of this. A lot of this is super advanced that as you become better and you dive into this, there might be something that you want to use in here. But the thing that I'll show you right here is auto review. It is off. I do not like auto review. People like when you take a picture, they like to be able to see the picture right after they take it. That's a distraction. Now it doesn't happen when you have your eye up to the electronic viewfinder. It's when you take your eye away from it, it shows you it. I don't like it. I don't want it popping up, so I have it on off. If you ever find yourself where it's popping up and you're like, I don't know what happened because my wife changed it or something, blame your wife, but just leave it on off. Next up, we have shoot mode selection for the screen. I leave it on display versus not displayed. It just tells you what shooting mode you are in. We've got number nine, number nine, number nine, power setting options, auto monitor off, it does not turn off. For us, we have that turned off because we don't want it to reset while we're recording, but it is a good idea to set that and limit it to say maybe 60 seconds, or if you want it to be longer, you could set it to longer. Power save start timer is currently off. We've got power save by monitor is both linked. Auto power off temperature is set to high. So if you're out in a bright area or, or a hot area and you're shooting a lot of video, you can set the temperature to high, which means it's going to record for longer, but keep in mind, your camera is going to get much hotter. It says it, the temperature of the device may rise to prioritize recording time. Would you like to change the setting? We're gonna hit cancel. So we're gonna leave it in high, which is that mode. Uh, and then we've got sound options. Volume settings are currently set to seven for your headphones. You've got your four channel audio monitoring. This is again going into Th this camera is super powerful. So even if you just bought your first camera and this is it, just understand that you have a lot of capability with this body that you can do. So we're gonna keep going. You got USB, USB connection modes. A lot of this is diving too deep. External output is for someone like us. We're using an external recorder right here. This is where you would control those settings. And then you've got setup options video light mode, anti-dust function, so much goes on in here, display the serial number. There's so much you could do in this camera. I mean, that takes us through the entire menu. Like I said, if I went through everything, this would be a four hour video. I'm trying to give you the cliff notes of the most important stuff and allow you to dive in deeper for when you need to dive in deeper and feel that there's something that you wanna tweak yourself. The next thing I'm gonna go through is we're gonna flip into video mode and I'm gonna show you the menu settings for that. We don't have to change everything, there's just a few that I wanna show you. So now that I've switched into the video mode, we now have the video menu options. Now I'm not going through everything here because a lot of it is redundant from what was in photos, but we're gonna start here with image quality recording. 
uh, we're gonna go over to the file format, and Steven was telling me that he likes, because Steven does all our video, he likes to be in XAVC I 4K, that's the all I, that's the highest bit rate, that is where he likes to shoot that in. Next, we're gonna jump down to the SNQ, the slow and quick settings. So this is where you're gonna go and say, I wanna be 24P, I wanna be in 60P, at how many frames per second, right? It's gonna show you what you're capable of doing there. So if you wanna go to 60P or you wanna go to 24P, we can go all the way up to one frame, down to one frame and up to 60 frames per second. So those are your options. You can go in there and set that. Um, record settings. Generally speaking, we go to the highest recording quality possible, as I said earlier. So that's what you wanna do. You've got your time-lapse settings. If you wanna do time-lapse for video, you go in here. It's like your inter intervalometer. It's gonna walk you through what you need to do. We've got log shooting settings. In case you wanna shoot log, you would go into on, um, and that's so you could do S log, and that's more of a flat file format that you have more control over after you are done shooting. You also do, we don't touch proxy settings here, and the APS shooting, if you were to shoot in S, uh, Super 35 or with an APS-C lens, it will automatically crop that down to the proper ratio that you need it to be. So going back, we're gonna jump, skip all of this stuff because we already know what this does. We said it before with stills, to audio recording. This is where audio recording is either on or off. We've got audio recording levels. Right now it's set to 26, but I could dial that down and I could turn it all the way down to one and you can watch as the uh, recording levels go lower. As the this becomes more sensitive, you can see it goes there. Let's see if I can make it peak. Peak! There, that red, that's it peaking. That's not a good thing. So you can go, this is more advanced, you could go ahead and set that. Um, white noise reduction is set to auto. Steven, you turn this off? Oh, sorry, wind noise. I My reading was terrible on that, Steven. We're gonna go with wind noise for 10, Alex, because I'm having trouble after doing this for two hours. So. Wind noise I like to turn off. And you would use a windscreen on your, on your microphone. That's gonna do a little bit better of a job. I don't like anything that's really done digitally because it might compress your audio and it might not sound as good. And then we're gonna skip ahead all the way down to shooting options where we have auto framing settings. This camera lets you do something that's pretty cool. If you're gonna film yourself and you want it to, and you're gonna move around, well, this camera can punch in and make it look like it's following you around just by shooting in a certain format and then moving around that little box. And it's gonna automatically do that. So it's gonna be pretty cool if you are shooting yourself. But this is where all of those settings are. Um, it's a really powerful option if you are doing video of yourself. Next, we're gonna skip around to autofocus where we've got our AF transmission, no, transition speed, not a car. So this is how fast you want it to rack. Do you want it to be more cinematic and slower? If so, you dial it down to slow, and that's the focus is gonna be much slower in terms of its racking, or you could have it go super fast if you want it to be faster when you are racking. And those are the settings, the main settings that we're gonna focus on for the video menu setting. As you get more proficient with your camera, you're gonna figure out how to dive into there to learn the settings that you need to learn. But again, we don't want this to be a four hour long video. We think that we hit the best of the best with honor, sir, for you. And that, that takes us through the menu settings finally for stills and finally for video. And next, I'm gonna explain what all of the things mean on the back of the screen or when you're looking through the electronic viewfinder. So now let me show you what you're gonna see on the screen. Now remember, if you don't see exactly what I see, you could always hit the display button up on the back of the camera, and that's gonna to toggle you through the different display options. So if you find yourself going, I don't see what you see and I don't know how to change it, you might have accidentally hit the display up and that's how you cycle through and make those changes. Keep in mind, you have your function button. If you hit that, you can pull up all of these custom functions to quickly get to quickly, because that's what you do when you do something quickly. And I can't swipe on my screen right now to bring up those tile menus, but you can because I, you, you know, you're not touching, you're not plugged into what I'm plugged into. So let's start at the top left of the screen. That icon there is showing you your memory card. Next to that, we see 1,780. That's how many frames of still shots that I have left that I can shoot 
onto the memory card. Next to that, to the right, it says that I'm shooting raw large plus JPEG fine in 33 megapixels. The hand that looks like it's waving to you that says on, well, that is your image stabilization. It's letting you know that that is on, and it's showing you that I'm in AFC, which is continuous focus. To the far right of that on the screen is 17% on my battery. So I've used quite a lot of battery power while making this video, so there's only 17% left. Below that on the right of the screen is your metering mode, then auto white balance. AF on is right now showing you that it's auto focused for people. We've got mechanical mode, that's mechanical shutter, not electronic or silent. And then below that PP means picture profile is currently off. ISO is set to 10,000. If I wanna change that, look at this. I can just go ahead and turn this dial and it's changing. Yep, that's because we set that as a custom setting. And the funny thing is it didn't go below 400 because earlier we locked it to say it can't go below 400. The blinky blink at negative two right there is the light meter telling us we don't have enough light. But if I was to take that off, take the lens cap off, do you see how it's changing? Now it's overexposed at plus one or 0.7. It's all dependent upon where you're looking. So let me put the lens cap back on. We're set to f2.8, or as I turn the front dial with my finger, it is changing. And we've got our shutter speed at 1 100th of a second, or as I dial that up, it can go to 1 1,000th. It can go all the way up to 1 4,000th of a second, and then all the way down to like, what is this, 30 seconds, 60 seconds? Oh, bulb, there's bulb and 30 seconds. We've got our picture style on the left bottom part of the screen, so it's in standard. Our uh, DRO is currently set to auto. I leave that there. We've got our focusing mode. That's what the lock on tracking looks like. And what that means is when you press your finger halfway down, it's showing you that it's gonna lock on and track. We're in single shooting. That's what the single box looks like. But if I hit this left arrow, I'm gonna go back into high plus, and now it should show us high plus on the screen, which it does. We're also in manual mode. The C means copyright, and that is taking us around the screen and showing you what the icons mean when it comes to stills. Now let's show you the screen that you're gonna see when you are doing video. Reminder, it might look a little different than mine. Hit that display button up if it looks a little different, but also remember, swipe from the left, Swipe from the bottom, your custom settings. We also have our function button we can go ahead and hit. And now the function button is different than what we saw the function button for when it was for stills, because now we're doing it for video. So let me get back out by hitting function again, and we'll start at the top left hand of the screen. You can see that the meter is moving. That is your audio meter as I speak. To the right of that, we see that we're in AFC for continuous autofocus. We're in standby, meaning it's not shooting video, but if I was to press the record button, it would start recording video in 4K 24P, which, are the, which is the frame rate that we're shooting at. We are going to that memory card, and it says two hours and 35 minutes of record time. And now we're down to 15% battery life. Remember, these are really good batteries, but I've just been using it for the last three and a half hours making this video. As you go down to the bottom of the screen, you've got your metering mode that is set. You've got your DRO, which is still auto, which it was the same when it was with stills. Auto white balance is what AWB stands for. Next to that is your ISO is set to 400. If I turn this dial, I'm changing my ISO for video. It's probably gonna below, go below 400. Nope, it's set to 400 because I guess I set that automatically there. You've got your metering mode is negative two because we are not, we have no light coming into the camera. And we are at F5. As I dial that down, we're at F4, we're at F3, two, we're at F2.8. And then our shutter speed is off to the left hand side. That's it. That is what you're gonna see for video. And if you wanna follow, you know, change your focusing mode, you just press the button halfway down as always, and it's gonna track the subject, but we're not shooting video right this second and we're not looking at a subject. But it, a lot of this can be self-explanatory. I showed you the best of what I could show you to give you the best jump start possible. Let me show you what happens when you hit the record button. We're gonna press it. I hear the sound of boop. The red record box comes around the screen and you've got recording showing you right in the middle and it's counting up. So you should have unlimited record time as long as you have enough battery power and enough storage on your card. We don't have a lot of battery power, but to stop it, I go ahead and hit the button again. We hear the boo doo doop and now we are done recording video. Whew, I get it. 
it's a long video. Believe me, these are, a, these are tough videos to make. It takes a lot of time and preparation, and by preparation, it just takes a lot of time to go through everything. Um, I appreciate you guys watching this. If this helped you out, or if you got this far, first and foremost, hashtag, I got this far, leave that down below, and also, please subscribe to the channel. There's always videos coming out. There's fun, informative content, there's photo news, there's reviews of lenses, reviews of cameras, there's critiques, there's a ton of content that I continually make, and there's also 3,000 plus videos that I've already put into the Frochive, so you can go back and watch as many of those as you would like. Don't forget to give thumbs up where you see our videos because it lets us know that you like them. Thank you guys very much for watching this. Congratulations on your camera, or if you're watching this before you buy the camera, we do have a link down below, which is an affiliate link, which helps us continue to make these types of videos if you use our link when you make a purchase. That's it. Thank you, Stephen, for doing this. Yeah, I, I got a, th he gave me a thumbs up like I can see, like you guys can see him. Jared, PolandFronosPhoto.com. See ya.